Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the From Tablet of Stone to the Heart lecture series. I'm Kimon Ashman, and beside me is Jamin Williams, and we will be your host for this evening's program. We welcome both our parishioners, both locally and internationally. I am excited for this series, and I hope that you are excited too. We started yesterday with Pastor Roosevelt Laban, who started off this series with a bang. And by presenting on the first commandment, he presented with power and indeed clarity. Indeed, Pastor Loban did a superb job by reminding us of the first commandment which is recorded in Exodus chapter 20, one to three. Now, if you missed that presentation, please go and watch the recording at your own leisure. Together, Together we, we extend, extend warmest Sunday welcome, welcome to everyone. everyone. Welcome, 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 a, a blessing, blessing awaits you all. all. Please give a wave, post an emoji, in the chat or simply state where you are worshiping from so that you can be acknowledged. And please join us nightly on Sundays and on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. and on Sabbaths at 11 a.m. and also 3 p.m. on Facebook and you can also join us on YouTube at Tredega Park SDA Church. And don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell and also turn on your note of post notification so that whenever Tridigal Park SDA goes live, you will be notified. Awesome. So at the end of each presentation, you will have an opportunity to pose your questions. And so I'm going to ask Sister Williams to monitor our Facebook. I'm going to ask Elder Miller to monitor the YouTube chat and Elder Burton to monitor the Zoom chat so that persons who are posing their questions, that the relevant questions can be asked and the presenter will have ample time to answer accordingly. Okay, awesome. At this time, we will be moving right along into our program. So we'll begin by having our song service, which will be done by Endless Faith Ministry also they will be doing our theme song, which is, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. As we begin our song service tonight, we're going to invite you to go ahead as we pray. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you for your blessing through this day, Lord. And as we are about to go into your song service at this time, Lord, we pray that you may tune our voices as we sing songs of praise to your name. Guide us and protect us for the remaining portion of this program. We pray and ask all these mercies in your name, I pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to go straight into some live courses. You can feel free to join us in singing wherever you are. Why I love him so 
is so real to me.
Good evening, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure and a privilege to call upon the name of the Lord. Thank you so much, Father, for giving us this great privilege. Let us pray to officially begin our series. Loving Father, you are great and you are greatly to be praised. There is indeed none like you. We give you thanks and we praise your whole name because, Lord, you are worthy. And you are indeed deserving of all the praise and honor and glory that human beings can express through their vocal cords. So now, dear Father, we ask you in a marked way that you will indeed come by here and just bless this service. We pray, dear loving Father, that through your grace and through your spirit, dear Father, you will anoint us from the crown of our heads to the sole of our feet, dear Father. I ask in a marked way that you will be with our presenter today. Help us, dear Father, as we listen to the words taken from Exodus 4, verse 6. That, Lord, we will be transformed and that you, dear Father, will inspire your man servant tonight to speak words, dear Father, and put new meaning to your commandments that says we should not have any other gods before you, but that we should not make any grave image before you, dear Father. Help us to understand that you are the only God that is deserving of glory and deserving of honor because we know that you are a jealous God. So, Father, help us hide your word in our hearts so that we may not sin against you. Father, we know that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Loving Father, may tonight's service be a means of transforming and agitating the hearts of your people, dear Father, towards loving you and serving you and placing you at the forefront of their lives. May they walk with you, dear Father, so that you may go before them, stand behind them, and be beside them. Lord, I pray for every person that is listening to this service tonight, dear Father, on every platform that your word will be sent out. Lord, I pray that your sweet Holy Spirit will transform, renew, and recommit all your people to, to your love and to your law. Oh, loving Father, we know that these times are heavy, that, Lord, the coronavirus is wreaking havoc on, on this planet, dear Father. Lord, we know that there are wars and pestilence all over this place. But, Father, in spite of it all, we know that you are still in charge. And your words, dear Father, will not... Return to you void until they have fulfilled the purpose for which you sent them. So, loving Father, we leave all things in your care tonight, knowing fully well that you are able there, Lord, to do for us that which we are unable to do for ourselves. Until you shall return there, Father, keep us faithful, keep us holy, keep us righteous, but most of all there, Father, keep us in the hollow palms of your hands, so that when, Lord, you shall burst the eastern sky. May all of us, dear Father, who are listening tonight, who are joining from everywhere, every corner of the globe, dear Father, will hail you as our personal Savior from sin. Until then, dear Father, help us to remain true to you and help us to give ourselves all, give off all ourselves to you, dear Father, so that whenever you come, you can claim us into your everlasting kingdom. Thank you, dear Lord, for hearing our prayers and thank you for answering we pray. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Brother Sunderland and Endless Ministries. We will now continue our program with our opening hymn, which will be done by Elder Carl Burton, followed by our scripture reading, which will be read by Elder Rosemary Sutherland. Our, our opening hymn tonight will be hymn number 272 in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Mel, 272. Give me the Bible, holy message. 
The scripture reading is taken from Exodus chapter 20, and I'll be reading from verse 4 through to verse 6. That's Exodus chapter 20, reading from verse 4 through to verse 6. I'll read in your hearing. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Here hands the reading of God's holy word. Amen. The opportunity is mine to present and introduce our presenter for this evening. Pastor Peter Lopez is no stranger to the Tredega Park District of Churches. In fact, he served the Tredega Park as junior pastor from August 2018 to July 2019. Currently, he is the district pastor of the Cross Hill SDA District of Churches, which comprises of Cross Hill, Brandon Hill, Kellitz, Matney, and Sandy River SDA Churches. He is married to Shelika Brown Lopez, and the union has produced one son, Liam Neal. His personal motto is, know why you do what you do before you do it. However, before we hear from Pastor Lopez, Sister Colleen Surf will bless our hearts with the song of meditation. Then we will hear our theme song once again by Endless Faith Ministries. Be blessed. Blood, 
into the presentation, but before I do so, I just want to give my vote of thanks to Sister Williams for her kind words of introduction and for Endless Praise Ministry for their lovely singing from the beginning of the program until now. So because the time is far spent, I will not uh, go into too much more preamble and I will go right into the presentation. So I want to also thank uh, Pastors Noban and Williams for the invitation and for the Tradiga Parks and the Adventist Church, who always treats me uh, like one of their own. So being here with you is uh, my privilege and pleasure. So we are part of the, uh, or we are on the second leg of our, from the tablet of this, from the tablet of stone to the heart lecture series where we are looking at the Ten Commandments. And uh, before we get into what we uh, will receive from the Lord, let us uh, bow our heads as we pray. Thank you, Lord, for bringing your people on tonight. And I pray that wherever they are, however they are watching, that uh, you will teach, that you will enlighten, that you will exalt not only your word, but uh, all our mental faculties in understanding what it is that you would have shared with us through inspiration. So that as we go from day to day, we will be able to adequately live the way you'd have us to live, and also be bold in our witness, knowing that you would have given us what we need to share with others. 
name I pray. Amen. All right. So we are looking at Exodus uh, 24 to 6. And so we are going to look at uh, the passage under the caption, Make No Carved Image. And the reason uh, the title is written this way is I am following the original language. Pastor Loban would have done a very good job yesterday of explaining some of these little nuances regarding the language. So I won't go too much into that sort of explanation. So just understand when you see make no carved image, it is how it is written in the original language as we have received it. So the second of the covenant stipulations is very straightforward. And you see that I have covenant stipulations in all caps and commandment in quotes. You're going to understand why covenant stipulation is in bold and the commandment is in quotation. As with all covenants, and when you talk about a covenant, think about a contract. So you have to sign something. And when you sign a contract, you have it in the duplicate or triplicate. So many individuals must have a copy of the contract. So same with the contract, same with covenants, the same rules. All that is required is a part of what uh, the testator realizes is necessary for the efficient running of uh, business, of uh, relationship, whatever way you want to coin it. But for our intent and purpose and the scriptural intent and purpose, we are going to look at it from a relational perspective because that's what the yeah, Yahweh God intended. So we have to understand what uh, the commandments are. And again, you see it in quotes. And in order to understand what they are, to have a meaningful discussion about it, we first have to establish what they are. So many times, uh, based on our traditional way of teaching the Ten Commandments, we teach them as injunctions, as laws that tell us what not to do. And then we forget that there are at least two commandments that uh, are positive rather than coming from a negative perspective. But I digress. So let's establish what they are. This is how we normally view or think about the Ten Commandments. Two tables of stone written on one side, one side having four commandments, the other side having six. But actually the two tables of stone meant something different. So the agreement that was made, the commandments, they were not written on only one side of the stool. They were written on both sides, which means that one copy, so one tablet, one table represented Israel's copy, and the other table represented God's copy. So it's not about two tablets, four and six commandments on one side of the two tablets. It's back and front. So all ten commandments would or were held on one table of stone, one tablet, which would represent the contract copy of Israel and the contract copy of God. Both of them would have a copy. So the covenant stipulation must begin with a declaration of who makes a covenant binding. And again, Pastor Loban would have gone through this yesterday. And Exodus 20 begins with God pronouncing himself, I am Yahweh Elohim. If you remember our Bible class series before I left, and for those who weren't there, let me explain something about what you see in your Bibles. When you see Lord in caps in the Old Testament, that is the given name of God, Yahweh. It's a traditional thing not to translate or transliterate the name because of how the Jews respected or looked at the given name of God. So it came over into all the other versions of the Bible 
where instead of uh, translating Yahweh as Yahweh, it is translated as Lord. Another way that uh, the Jews would uh, make it possible to speak the name of God or the given name of God. And I, I wanted to put name of God in quotes. Is that uh, they would add uh, the vowels from Adonai to the consonantal form of Yahweh and that transforms into Jehovah. So traditionally we have come to use the name Jehovah as the name of God, but it's actually a made up name so that uh, those who speak it would not have to speak God's real name. So God begins, the, the testator begins by saying, I am Yahweh Elohim. I am Yahweh God. So he declares himself. So I am the one who has the power to make this agreement. And so every contract starts. You think about the work contract, the name of the employer is emblazoned, and they speak about themselves in the third person and all these lovely things. So for those of us who are professionals, and even those of us who have to sign contracts regarding going to school, university, it's the same thing. The one who has the power to make the contract, name appears first. I am Yahweh Elohim. So, where Israel was situated is called the ancient Near East. So, the one who initiates the agreement, as I just explained, must affix his title. So his name or the person's name and title, and I say his because in that area it is a patristic society. So you generally say the male aspect. You, you, women didn't have this sort of power. So it's always a male aspect. So those who had the ability to make these uh, contracts would affix their name and also their title. So Yahweh declared himself and his title to Israel. So we look at his name and title. I am Yahweh God. But another element of the covenant is a claim to relationship. I hope I'm not going too fast. I hope that you're running quickly with me. So Yahweh Elohim says, I saved you from slavery. I'm paraphrasing what is there. So he begins by saying, I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So my name is Yahweh. I am God. I saved you from slavery. So because of that now, we are going to initiate a binding relationship. That's the nature of the contract. So everything that follows in the covenant stipulation, everything that comes after that is dependent on Yahweh and what he did for Israel. So let me go back to the previous slide. I am Yahweh Elohim that saved you from slavery. That is a precursor. That is uh, your first course. That is your appetizer. Whatever term that makes it uh, become a reality to you. This is what happens. God says, I am who I am. I saved you from slavery. Therefore, don't have any other gods before me. Don't make, which is what we are going to look at in a bit. So everything that comes after this declaration is dependent on the declaration. I am Yahweh, God, I save you from slavery. Therefore. So this is why what we call the Ten Commandments are actually relationship guidelines. The, 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 <laughs> I suppose coming from a Seventh day Adventist, this is going to sound weird, but I guess I say weird things many times. The Ten Commandments actually have a negative connotation to them for those who are not Seventh day Adventists. Even those who are not religious, when they hear Ten Commandments, it brings about a negative connection to them. And it's because they think about somebody ordering them to do something. 
And if you think about uh, even our children, especially when they, throughout their life, the only time they may be kind of obedient is when they are children between six to about nine, 10, 11. As they get to puberty, they start rebelling again, just like when they are toddlers and babies. If you tell them not to do something, that's exactly what they're going to do. You tell your son or your daughter, do not date this boy or this girl. And the very next thing they do is go and date that boy or that girl. Because how oh dare you want to stop me from enjoying my life. So the negative connotation is there. Because of the traditional terminology used for Exodus 20 and what is written there. So there are actually relationship guidelines. So you can see a book that you can look at regarding this if you are one to read. And I would encourage all of you to be readers. Torah, Old and New, page 180 to 182. You can look at the aspect of what we call the Ten Commandments and realize that it is a relationship guideline. We are entering into an agreement. Remember, I am Yahweh Elohim. I save you from slavery. Because of that, we are now going to come together as one. And in order to be one, this is how we are going to interface with each other. That's what the Ten Commandments really are, relationship guidelines. So you have Yahweh, you have salvation, you have Israel. You see everything stemming from the commandments. I, I guess I could have done the graphics a little differently. But then first, Yahweh provides salvation to Israel, and then Israel turns or reciprocates that the gratitude in having a profitable relationship with Yahweh. So Yahweh comes down, and then Israel. If you think that this is the point where you're uncomfortable, think about our own salvation. Yeshua, Jesus came down so that we can go up. That has always been the way that God functions. He has always condescended so that we can ascend. So his condescension leads to our ascension. And I'm not going to start preaching that uh, in part of the day. Another important book is that covenants were oral. And another book you can look at is oh, well, a journal here, Journal of Biblical Literature, an article by one called Stephen. So, covenants were oral in that time and place where the Ten Commandments were given. So if you think about the entire area, the nature of the area, the covenants of the area, when one was making an agreement, and I only gave the Exodus version, but if you think about it, uh, if you're a good Bible student, and you think about it, uh, you think about it, uh, Noah, you think about Abraham, you think about Jacob, you think about Boaz when he went to procure Ruth as his wife, you see so many other covenants. All of them were verbal, oral, spoken. If you read Exodus properly, starting from Exodus 19, you will realize that what we call the Ten Commandments were spoken. I God in Israel. It is in verse 19 after God was finished that the Israelites said to Moses, We are in fear of our lives. If he continues speaking to us, we feel like you're going to die. You go up to him, let him speak to you, then come back down to us and tell us what he says. When you come to Exodus 31, 18, you will see the declaration that when God had finished speaking to Moses in Sinai, that God made two tables of stone and he wrote on them the word that he spoke. Now, that passage can lead to another investigation, which I will just mention in passing, just to ease your brain and you can think about it. From Exodus 20 to Exodus 31, those are 11 chapters. Those 
sorry, let's stop. God spoke through the entirety of those 11 chapters. And it one said that God wrote everything he said on the tablets of school. Would it be that everything that was said from 20 to 21 were etched on those two tablets of stone? Not just the Ten Commandments. Just a biblical investigation for those who are Hey, that's how that God, God, everything God, he said, desire to look on the tablets of school. So, now that we have established what the Ten Commandments are, they are relationship guidelines. So, we don't think about them in the negative aspect. But again, for us, I said with the Adventists, the Ten Commandments will really come off negative. But we're thinking about those outside of us who view these uh, Ten Relationship Guidelines as restrictive based on how it is sheer. So, for us as the Adventists and like Christianity in general, we are viewed as uh, the church of do not. So it's uh, more about not doing and not enough of what do you do. So it, it really affects evangelism when individuals do not view the church as being a positive influence in their overall welfare. So we have uh, looked at what the commandments are, relationship guidelines. Pastor Loban did a good job with the commandment one yesterday. So let's look at make no carved image. Now, this idol was found uh, in the area of Israel. It's a Phoenician idol. They did not find the name of the idol, but you can see that it had uh, three heads and uh, basically three torsos and three legs. We, we don't know what it is that they were trying to create in terms of a look, but based on archaeology, this is a Phoenician idol. We don't know the name. We don't know what they were actually trying to achieve. We don't know if it is a trinity or if it's one individual in a Trinitarian state having three different aspects. So, it's relational. The gods had a dependent relationship. And humanity had a dependent relationship on the gods. So it's back and forth. It's a transactional thing. Think about it as, uh, I don't want to use that first example that came to mind. I want to use a, a more prudent example, something more kosher. A university and a student. It's a transactional relationship. The student pays to learn and the university teaches to get paid. So the student pays to learn and the university teaches to get paid. It's transactional. So the student gives and the university gives. The way the ancients thought, including Israel, is that they give to the gods in order to get from the gods. So, I'm, I'm sticking to the commandment. I'm not going to go into too many other scriptures. So, be, by this example, both gods and humans needed each other. Both gods and humans needed each other. So, you, gods needed sacrifice and the humans needed good weather. <laughs> so, when the gods get the sacrifice, they give the humans good weather. That's the sort of transactional relationship that we're talking about. So you think about peace and reproduction. Humans had to do what was necessary to please the gods. And uh, the gods were bound to show kindness to the devout. So if you are a good person, good is supposed to happen to you. That is their idea, their black and white idea of justice. If you're good, good comes. And if their idea of good is that you do what is necessary to keep the gods happy. If that meant you needed to sacrifice your first child, you cry and you sacrifice your first child because the gods needed to be happy and the gods would allow you to have more children. So the gods showed kindness to those who were faithful. See their Torah through time by Cherry, page 76. So this is an animistic style of religion. So 
animism is about uh, inanimate things being given human or divine qualities. Therefore, rivers, mountains, and idols represented deities. Like I learned that Isis was uh, connected to the Nile. So if you think about uh, what happened between Pharaoh and Moses, God kept attacking their idols. That's basically what the plagues were. God kept attacking their idols because every single plague was attached or the, the Egyptians attached the animal, the weather, the surrounding area to a deity, deity. So every time God did something, he was literally beating up on their gods. And that is why eventually the Pharaoh said, get out of my place because if you guys stay here, we're just going to die. So just hurry up and leave. I don't even care, just go. So this is what happened in that time period. And this led to a uh, aloofness between the deity and worshippers. So it, it wasn't even relational. It's not about love. I do so that you can do. Just like a student who goes through university, that, that student doesn't have to love the university. The student went there for a degree. So I get my degree and I go. I don't owe you anything. I paid you. You did not admit me for free. And even if you admitted me for free, just because of my abilities. And uh, my abilities would be promotion to you. So it's still not free. Because you would use my image and likeness to say, this person got a free ride to my school because they are brilliant. And if you are brilliant, the same thing can happen for you. So there's no love. There's no connection there. It's just transactional. So there, there's a separation. In it, aloofness. There's a separation. But Yahweh was determined to be close to Israel. So God was already showing them, I am not like what you understand the divine entity to be. So I am not separate, as, as Moses would say in Deuteronomy 6. Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. That's why he began with, uh, I am God. What we call commandment one, relationship, stipulation one. I am God, me, I am alone, nothing else, just me. Then looking at what we're looking at tonight, he then says, don't make any carved image. Make no carved image. But we'll, we are going to get there. We're going to close in short order. Jeremiah 23, 23. God through the prophet says, am I a God at hand, say the Lord, and not a God afar off? The, the, the King James makes it a little bit convoluted. But what is being communicated here is God is saying that I am close to you because when you read the following verses, you realize God is saying, I am not far from you. I am right here with you. You're treating me like I am far away, but I am right here. He always, I am always intended to be close to his creation. And you'll see that in Genesis, the Lord God formed man. So God went down to the ground that he created and then he molded, he carved man. I wanted to pay attention to my words because some of you might get a little bit more antsy for the next few slides. God came down to the earth and he carved man out of the earth. And then he breathed life into him. Genesis 2, 7. So you see intimacy there, closeness. God didn't intend to be far from his creation, but there is something else being communicated from this verse. And this is where some of you might get a little bit antsy and want to string me up and pick it my house. Yahweh already had an idol. Do not, or let me, let me stop saying do not. The Hebrew doesn't say do not. Make no carved image. There's a reason Yahweh says make no image. Because Yahweh already carved an image of himself. But before you string me up, 
Let us look at the Bible. We're going to look at some words in the Bible that are translated as idol in the King James. So the first one is Pesel. That is the one used in Exodus 20, verse 4. Pesel. Then you have Semel. Second Chronicles 33, 7. You have others as well. So these are not the only verses that these words are used. But you're going to realize something as we go along. Then you have uh, Mephleset. That is uh, used in uh, 2 Kings 15, 3. Mephleset. And uh, 1 Kings 15, 13, sorry. That has to do with uh, what God calls a terror. So this is, this is a stronger word now, looking at idolatry, or looking at idols. Atsab, to carve our pain. We uh, hear about the prayer of Jabez. We read about the prayer of Jabez. Jabez's name is actually a reversal of Atsab. He was named Jabez because he caused his mother pain at birth. That's what his name means. And that is why he cried out to God, please bless me. I was uh, called pain. I caused suffering. But bless me nonetheless. And that's why in introducing Jabez, the word says he was more righteous than his brethren. So I, I, I'm giving you a lot of nuggets as we go along. Then you have Elil, vanity or idol. And then you have Selem. Elil is Zechariah 11, 17 and other passages. But Selem, you have Selem used quite a bit in the Old Testament. Image and idol, it would be translated as. And we have that in Genesis 1, 26, Genesis 5, verse 3, Numbers 33, 52, and others. Selem. And you will see the Genesis 1, 26 passage, which should already point you to what we are going to next. That's the word used. That's the word used to describe God created man. So God said, let us make man in our Salem, in our image. Make man in our image. Therefore, God already had an idol. When you look at the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible, Selem means an image or form of something as the shadow of the original. An image or form of something as the shadow of the original. So you should be already putting down your pitchforks and you should already be dousing those torches that you lit when I said God already had an idol because God's idol is you and me. Man is God's idol. He created us to be his image. No, that does not mean that we are physically like him. But how we are made in entirety is a reflection of him. And it's important to understand this in the context of the second relationship aspect that we're looking at. Make no our image. We are, humanity is God's idol. We are his image already. So the relationship guideline of Exodus 24 to 6 is not an injunction against figurines. It's not telling you that you can't make art or anything useful to beautify. When I was growing up, I was uh, told in church that we should get rid of all our figurines because it is against the second commandment. But even as a child, that didn't make any sense to me because I'm not worshiping the figurine. I am not worshiping the vase. I am not worshiping the picture. I am not worshiping the embroidery. And it takes out of consideration that when God speaks about the making of the sanctuary, there were a lot of images used of things above and things on earth to beautify the sanctuary. 
So would it mean that God is breaking his own relationship guideline? No, because it was never intended to speak about art or beautification. So statues and these things are not issues. The issue is the fact that God says, don't make them to bow down to them. So if we are making them to worship them, then that's a problem. That's what God is saying. That's what the law, the, the relationship guideline is saying. We are already representative of God. No entity that we make can represent God. So God is basically saying, you are already in my image. Israel, humanity, you are already in my image. You don't need another representation of me. Don't. In China, thing. God doesn't want a Nike that has an additional swoosh because it was made in China. It's insulting to God. So the curse that he added to the end of uh, the relationship guideline, again, is not because he's wicked. He's not that God wicked. But something occurs that uh, he's warning us against because it has consequences. It's going to cause a disruption in the relationship. Again, if I come to my bed and I see my wife with a life-size black dolly in the bed and calling this dolly Peter and rubbing down this dolly's head, I am going to be cross. What is that? And then she ignore me because she's uh, having fun with the dolly. No, that doesn't make no sense. That makes no sense. So God is saying, make no car image. It's insulting. It's disrespectful. But the injunction at the end. Why did God say what he said at the end of the commandment? Because I am protective of my image and I will cause all of your generations to suffer if you create an idol to worship. And again, this is why a lot of people view the Ten Commandments negatively. How can you make my up to my fourth generation suffer? But was that what God was saying? Through the prophet Ezekiel, God says, What mean ye that he used the proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten so are great, and the children's teeth are set on edge. What this proverb means in Israel is that the fathers did something, and now the children are suffering for it. So God is taking out his anger on those who did not do the thing. But we forget that the end of the relationship died then, the end of the second end of the second commandment actually tells us 
how this third and fourth generation comes in. So verse 3 of Ezekiel 18 says, As I live, saith the Lord, you shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. I am going to make you stop it. Because it's a wicked thing. You are giving a wrong impression of who I am. God is saying that's not who I am. So God needed to correct the idea that he punishes children for the sin of their parents. And when you read through the entirety of Ezekiel 18, you'll see that God goes to great pains to ensure that the people understand that if you sin, you suffer for your own sin. Don't, don't, don't talk about me sinning and my children suffering for it. No. Who sins? They will pay the consequence. Nobody else. When you think, of, and even, even getting this from God, it still doesn't change their mindset. Because when you get to the Gospels, when you get to John chapter 9, there was a blind man. And the first thing the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? So even up until the time that Jesus came, the Jews still had the idea that the parents' sin could cause destruction on their children. But what really was the commandment? What really was the relationship guideline saying when it talks about the third and fourth generation? It applies to those who hate me, hate me, Yahweh, me, they represent Yahweh, God. But the word their hate in the Hebrew actually means intend to harm me. So God actually see, sees the creation of another image to represent him as an attack against himself. God sees anything that we set up even to represent him. And I'm not going to give too much trouble. I, I know we are live streaming, so I'm not going to give too much trouble. So I'm not going to mention some of the things that we set up in place of God. But anything we set up in the place of God, God sees as an attack against Army. him. So God, why? Why? Think. Somebody distorts your image. What do I mean by that? You know who you are. You know that you're kind. You know that you're soft-spoken. You know that you're loving. But somebody, in order to create a false impression of who you are, goes about telling people that you're low, that you're boisterous, that you're manipulative, that you're angry, that you're dangerous, and you know you're none of those things. Think. God is saying, so you set up something even to represent me, you're actually creating a false impression of who I am because when you bow down to this thing, when you worship this thing, you are doing it with a mindset that the Israelites had, that the people of that area had at that time, that it's a transactional relationship. So the more I pray, the more God will do for me. The more tithes I return, the more God will do for me. The more I attend church, the more God will do for me. That transactional relationship by the images that we set up, God is saying, don't do it. I am not that person. Make no carved image. You're going to destroy our relationship and you are going to set up a situation where your third and your fourth generation learn from what you do. That's what the relationship guideline says. As a parent, we pass on to our children, we pass on to our community as leaders the things that we believe. So the third and the fourth generation comes in because these individuals learn from what we are doing. And they follow what we are doing. And therefore, the attack against God's character, the attack against God's person continues for a lengthy period of time. And they have to deal with the broken relationship between themselves and God. And sometimes we don't even know that we have a broken relationship with God because we have been taught traditionally that this is how you get close to God. But it's through something else that was set up. So how would you react? Somebody deliberately distorting who you are. How would you react? How do you expect God to react? God is God. 
if we react this way when somebody tells a lie on us, what do you think? How do you think God feels? We can see on the authority of the Bible, virgin and friends, we are God's image. They don't have to be shy about that. They don't have to worry that boy, Pastor Lopez, are telling us something that is, is troubling to my, my theological sensibilities. It's scriptural. We are God's image. We are his salem. We are made in his form and fashion. What that means, we may not know the entirety of the definition of what that means, but we can take it at face value that God made us personally. He did not call us into existence. He carved us out of the earth. And in the relationship injunction, in the relationship guideline, in the second commandment, he says, you don't need to do any of that. You don't need to go carve anything. I don't need representation. I already have you and you already have direct contact to me. We are God's image. We were made in his image and even after sin, we're still his image. Deformed and marred as we may be, we are still the image of God. So, what God is saying, you can find, this is paraphrasing what is in Moving Beyond Symbol and Myth, page 4. If you want to have a good relationship with me, Yahweh is saying, God is saying, you must voluntarily choose not to deface my image by creating a counterfeit. Don't create a counterfeit to God. Don't insult God. Don't deface God's image. Don't tell lies on God by creating a counterfeit. That's what God is saying. We are, I am close. As he said through Jeremiah 23, 23. I am close. We are right here. We are right here. You can touch me. You can feel me. Figuratively speaking. I am not so far from you that you have to make an intermediary. We don't need a proxy. For those of us who are good at technology, there's a thing called a proxy server where you route information through to get to another source. God is saying, you don't need any proxy server to get to me. You personally can get to me because I am close to you. I am right here. I came, I stayed, I liberated. No, this is what would make us continue having a good relationship. Don't create a conduct. We are already in God's image. We have to choose to understand his heart and not attack him by carving another image. We can decide that. We can look into ourselves because I'm not going to call out the things that we carve. I may have listed some before, but you may not have caught it in my listing. That was purposeful because each of us have to now sit and look into our spiritual lives to see if there is something that we have carved out for ourselves as a proxy between us and God. And then we have to decide it whether or not a mannequin of God is better than God himself. Where are you tonight? Have you carved out a lot of images? Have you caused God to erect his uh, defense mechanisms against you? Are you teaching those in your sphere of influence that these carved images are good enough? This is the way God wants it. Just like the Israelites in their misunderstanding. Where are you tonight? Don't you want to just have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus, with God? Aren't you yearning for that personal touch? Think about God and Adam. Think about God and Eve how intimate that connection was. Oh God, if I can 
use anthropomorphic language. In other words, if I can use language that speaks to our physical form. How God's hands went into the earth. How God's hands carved the different features of humanity. How God crafted his hair. How God formed out his eyes. God made his nose. God put the ribs and the organs and he carved and he fashioned everything down to the little toe. Think about that intimacy. Think about the fact that you are the descendant of who God created. We are God's Salem. We are his image. Think about what that means for all of us. Don't you want that close relationship tonight? I'm praying that there is somebody on or somebody who will be watching this at some point in time who will make that decision to have that personal connection and relationship with God. That personal decision to say, I will have no carved images in my life because I realize that for the sake of a good relationship with Yahweh, I need not make any carved images. God bless you. And that's where we close with the presentation tonight. Thank you, Pastor Lopez. And we will be facilitating a few questions. We have 15 minutes to do so. And so I'm going to ask Sister Williams to check if there are any questions on Facebook. I'm going to ask Elder Miller to check if there are any questions on YouTube and also Ella Burton to see if there are any questions in the Zoom chat. Seen any questions from Facebook tonight? Elder Miller, are there any questions on YouTube? So on YouTube, Sister Opal Gordon, she made a comment and she said, so it depends on what your idol is. If Yahweh is an idol, and I'm seeing one from Elder Glenroy Miller. Good night, Pastor Peter Lopez. So Pastor been made into his image. When I do like tattoo and other things to our body, then we are destroying his image. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing he's asking if when we do tattoos, if, if, if we are destroying the image, God's image. All right, thank you for those questions and uh, comment. I'll start with the comment first. So let me clarify it once more. It's not that Yahweh is an idol, but in the sense of the word image, in the sense of the word that is there in uh, the commandment, humanity is already in the image of Yahweh, the image of God. So that segues into Elder Miller's uh, question. Sin makes us deface God's image in whatever way it is. So if you think about any way that we deface God's image, and again, I am leaving up to you to look 
into different aspects of what we do as human beings. So deface God's image or to set up another image to God. Because we can also make the negative image of ourselves as well. We can start worshipping ourselves. So we now become primary what we want. It's more important than what the relationship between ourselves and God requires. Vows, as I mentioned, think about a marriage. There are vows that one have to take when they're married. And this is why I went to the beginning to show you what they, what we call the Ten Commandments, what they are, the covenant stipulations, the relationship guidelines. Every relationship has vows. The married couple have to speak the vows first, and then they have to sign their names to say that, yes, I have made a vow. That form of contract is not beginning in modern society, it's from way back. And that's the form that God used with the people at Sinai also. So those relationship guidelines in relation to another image, God is saying, for you, our sake, so it's not just your sake, but it's for our sake, me, you, do not create something else. You are enough and I am enough. We don't need a third part. And I leave it there. I'm saying it's a very informative and interesting presentation. And I must just add, I, I felt a while ago as if I was still in college when we were doing classes together. So I must say publicly, Thank you for your presentation. I am looking through the chat and I am not seeing any other questions. And so since there are no other questions, we will now proceed to express appreciation as we pull the curtains down for this evening. Let me just use this medium to say thank you to Pastor Peter Lopez for taking time out to be with us for this lecture series on the Ten Commandments. Thank you for such an enlightening, informative, and an educate and educating presentation on the Second Commandment. We were blessed tremendously by your presence and by your presentation. Thanks also to all our participants, our technical team, to you, our viewers, and to our visitors, I must say, to God be the glory. Indeed, great things he has done. Amen, amen. Let me remind each and every one that we continue on Wednesday evening, same time, same place, but with a different presenter. So we will be looking at the third commandment where Elder Evangelist Paul Newton will pick up the baton to share and to present the third commandment. Do have yourself a wonderful rest of the night. And remember, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. God bless you. God bless and thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you, Pastor Lopez. Thank you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Blessings, blessings. I'm just hoping that uh, I didn't make a lot of muddy or clothing, but it's clear, clear, clear.